Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. My name is Ariba Shabbi. Welcome back to the course on English language teaching. We have discussed phonology and morphology and the module that we are covering is the structures of English language. We are going to discuss syntax and semantics in this session. So before we proceed further, let's recapitulate of what we did in the last session. In the last session, we discussed phonology and morphology, which are the important components of language learning and teaching. We learn place and manner of articulation, which are helpful in understanding consonants and vowels and the articulation in an efficient way. Moreover, we understood morphology, which helps us a reader determine the meaning of an unfamiliar word by enabling the reader to segment, break down a word into its root word and its effects. We also learn uh, the inflectional and derivational morphology and understood how it places an important role as far as the grammatical accuracy is concerned. Since we are going to discuss syntax and semantics in this discussion, we will be able to understand syntax and semantics as a subfield of linguistics which focus on the linguistic features. We will be able to apply general understanding of syntax and its semantics in the language learning pedagogy. So dear learners, when we talk about syntax, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? I am sure uh, syntax is a word which you might have encountered before. In case not, we will let you know that the rules which state how words can be combined into sentences basically refers to syntax. Syntax also talk about the rules which state how different combination of words give different meaning. For example, I write a sentence over here, dog chased the cat, right? And in the same way, I write cat chased the dog. The pitch that I am trying to make over here is that with the simple change in the arrangement of words, you find difference in meaning as well. So see dog chase the cat, it means dog, you know, there is a dog, there is a cat, dog is a subject, cat is an object and dog is following cat. But when we rearrange the sentence and put subject in place of object and the object in place of subject, we realize that the meaning also gets changed, right? So basically syntax refers to the rules which state how words should be arranged which words should be categorized into, uh, into, uh, into the subject uh, form, how words are placed in the predicate forms and how they are further categorized as noun phrase, you know, as, as clauses, as sentences and so on. So uh, not only this, when we talk about syntax, we also refer to semantics because with the change in the arrangement, the meaning also gets changed. So semantic here refers to the meaning which refer to the categories of words, okay. So semantics and syntax go hand in hand. Semantics is the possibility where we refer to the meaning uh, that are being derived from the categories of words. For example, if I say Ravi danced, now look up at this sentence. My first question to you here is, do you think it's a complete sen sentence? If yes, then how? Do you think that I have just put Ravi and danced on the other hand side and the sentence have just made up? I don't think so. Actually, we have put a noun and we have put an intransitive verb. 
I am sure your question would be that what is intransitive verb? So, the answer to this question is that an intransitive verb takes a subject and may not take object, right. So, uh, this sentence is made not merely the arrangement of words, but how and in what frame uh, these parts of a speech are put on that matters a lot. So, here I would say that it is noun and it is I would say that here uh, dance it is an intransitive verb. And after combining the noun and the intransitive verb you get the meaning of it and therefore, you form a mental representation of Ravi who danced therefore, you refer to the concept of semantics. So, dear learners, so dear learners, it is not the reason uh, when speakers learn, it is not the reason that we immediately uh, you know get the word uh, and we put it rather we look for the pattern in which those words are supposed to be fit in. One more thing is that this is the reason why uh, speakers learn a new word. Right. And you know after learning a new word they immediately get the idea of putting it into a sentence. You need not to tell them where to put it, but you can uh, uh, see and realize that they are putting at a right frame. When we talk about syntax, since I will cover semantics in the later in the second part of this session, when we talk about syntax we generally uh, put it into 5 categories and more than that in fact, because I have not included adverb over here, uh, but uh, uh, see noun is something which is very different from the definition which you have acquired since your childhood. Uh, you might have learned that noun is a, is a name of a place or thing or a place, let me tell you that this is not, this is a traditional definition which the modern linguists do not agree. So, noun here refers to the uh, component to, to, the, to the unit which comes right after the determiner. For example, you look up at the placement in this, uh, you, uh, you say a cat. Now, if you say that because cat is, uh, is an entity and you are naming it, then you might be referring to the old definition. What I am trying to tell you here is that a is a determiner. Okay. In determiner also we have uh, articles, we can also refer determiners as some few you know they are demonstrative, they are possessives and so on. So, here cat is the noun not because it is a name of an animal rather it comes right after the determiner, it positions itself after the determiner. In the same way you can take up with other examples, you say some cats, you say a friend, you can say the learners. In all these examples you find a very common relation, what is that relation? Basically you are putting noun right after the dinner. So, if I have to put it in a frame, I will say that noun comes after the determiner and therefore constitutes noun phrase. So, you will be amazed to know what is noun phrase and how come noun is uh, deriving a noun phrase. So, to clear out your confusion, uh, let us understand that noun phrase consists of a determiner and noun it may also consist of only noun. Okay. So, a noun phrase consists of noun and also a noun phrase can consist of adjective and noun. Okay. Now, coming up to the verb, verb uh, basically refers to the, uh, to, the play, to the unit which comes after the auxiliary. So, auxiliaries are will, shall, should, you know, you, if you say let us uh, let us understand with example, if you say will go. So, will is the auxiliary and go is the verb here, right. 
should complete okay i will run so will is basically uh, 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 is, is is an auxiliary and it is followed by verb now the point is what is adjective adjective is uh, adjective refers to the unit to to the word which comes between determiner and noun for example uh, i write the smart cat so in this example what do you see that the placement of the adjective is between the determiner and noun and therefore it is coming here when you talk about determiner as i told you it consists of articles it consists of other things like you say few cats a uh, few students so few uh, will be uh, will refer to determiner it will come under the category of uh, of of determiner similarly you say preposition in preposition you have one important aspect to note over here that preposition comes before noun phrase and if you look up at its composition you will find at the table or in case you write on the table then uh, what placement do you look for uh, basically at is coming before the noun phrase you will write preposition and then you will write noun phrase interestingly this entire composition is referred to as prepositional phrase so a prepositional phrase essentially consists of a preposition and noun phrase and if i have to further divide the noun phrase into its constituents i would say that it is uh, uh, it is coming up with a determiner and it is proceeding with uh, you know, with noun fine so uh, before going to the three diagrams or before we illustrate syntax in a more detailed way it is important to note that parts of a speech should be understood clearly because we have realized that students while learning syntax may or may not have a clear idea of what parts of a speech are or they might be having a notion of understanding these concepts uh, in terms of the old definitions that are prescribed uh, in, in 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 several books so uh, it's important to understand these aspects into in a modern way in a descriptive way when we talk about uh, phrase structure rules uh, we should not forget that language have rules for forming sentence and to help you understand clearly i'll write uh, a cat and you know that this particular composition is absolutely correct right similarly i can write the cat or if i write uh, 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 few students you know that these compositions are correct but what if i reverse these entire uh, uh, structures if i say cat a uh, or if i say cat the or in case i write students few my question to you here is that do you think these are grammatically correct phrases i'm sure your answer would be no because you have not heard it that way because you have not find in a in a in a systematic way that you have uh, understood so far so that's a reason why we try to organize certain words in a definite or in a systematic manner so the compositions that a phrase would include is noun and of course verb adverb or adjective and then you have determiner you have preposition and you try to uh, put it in a in, in a very logical way to make you understand uh, the idea of phrase structure rules let's consider these examples the first example as you see is ravi reads books now ravi if if we look up at this sentence we'll see that ravi is a noun right i'm trying to decompose the sentence into parts of a speech and then you find that there is a word called reads 
you find that this reads is verb okay like we have jump like we have uh, a read we have a cuff and so on so uh, these are referred to as verb uh, then we have books books are referred to as noun so uh, do you think that after gather, gathering these components will we be able to make a sentence yes of course because we have already made it not because primarily uh, because it is already given but because we can decompose and we can arrange it in a systematic way how so first we will think of a sentence and um, in sentence we will say that it is important uh, for a sentence to have a noun phrase right and if we look up for the noun phrase so noun phrase may consist of only noun or it may consist of an adjective and noun and it may also consist of determiner and noun so coming up to this sentence ravi reads books you will be able to find out that there is a noun which we will categorize it into noun phrase and therefore it is ravi okay now think of this particular word reads so reads to me and i'm sure to you is an element of verb and therefore i'll say that a uh, reads can be put up under the label of verb now come to the next word which is books to me books is again a noun right so again it would be a noun phrase and it composes of noun so that's how we have understood that a sentence can consist of noun phrase verb and noun phrase and that's very interesting interestingly in the next example as you see there it is written some students read story books okay now in this sentence you will find that there is a noun phrase there is a verb and there is again a noun phrase how if you decompose it you will see that some is working as a determiner and students is basically a noun so therefore d can be referred to some and n can refer to students the question here is what should we put in uh, under the label of verb then the answer here is that read should be put now the next question uh, the, now the next matter that uh, comes into our notice is of story books do you think that story is a noun or is it a book uh, that which is noun or do you think both are noun or do you think that both are adjectives or one is adjective and the other is noun let's try to understand if i look up at this component story in isolation i would think of noun because i would refer to the old definition which has been given to me since my childhood but if i look up at the modern perspective i'm sure i would be able to find out that story here is basically modifying books which is a noun so it is no more a noun rather it is an adjective that's how the placement would bring different results so i would say that it comprises of adjective and noun in the next example as you see it is written some student some young students read the story book okay now uh, this is an interesting one and i'm sure you will be able to do it i'm leaving it to you so some to give you an idea some is basically a determiner young is referring to the adjective and students is a noun and read is the verb here the story book again it is a noun phrase or if i have to further decompose it i'll say the is a determiner story is an adjective and here book is a noun fine 
and uh, you can easily make a tree diagram of uh, these components. After understanding how a tree diagram works, let us quickly revise that what are the steps involved in making it. First of all, you should have a ground knowledge of what parts of speeches are, what components does it include and also you should be able to mark them, right? And then you should be able to look for words and match the lexical categories. After the next step, you should be able to insert the words matching with the lexical categories under the labels. So, in the steps to make a tree diagram, uh, you go through all these steps and uh, you also should look for the constituency test. What are these? These come in two forms. One is the substitution test. And the other one is stand alone test. In substitution test, you take a word in a sentence and substitute with a pronoun. For example, you write uh, the dog chase a cat, right? Uh, can I say can I can I replace a cat with a pronoun? If can if uh, if I can replace it, then I'm sure I'm I'm passing. Then I'm sure this particular sentence is passed. Then I'm sure this particular sentence will pass the substitution, uh, the, the sub substitution exam. How? Uh, let's try to remove it and put it in place of cat the dog chase it. Is it making a sense? I think so. Therefore, you can conclude that it has passed the substitution test. Similarly, you can also replace the subject with the pronoun. Let us try. You can write it, chase it. This is one form of doing a uh, uh, substitution test. The other form of doing uh, uh, a constituency test is to look sentences through the lens of stand alone test. So, what happens in stand alone test? You ask a question, question like uh, who, uh, uh, a question like uh, what did the dog chase? And I am sure the answer to this question would be the dog chase a cat. So, if you are able to make all these utterances and be able to pass your sentences through the lens of both the constituency tests, then you are able to do it for further analysis. Now, let us quickly go through the principle of compositionality. Uh, the change uh, in the words, especially in uh, I am talking about a sentence when you see that you change the words in a sentence and you also realize that a meaning is also getting changed, then you feel that this sentence is basically a reference of the principle of compositionality. To make you this concept clearer, I will use an example and this is the dog hit the man, right? And I can also write the dog hit the cat. So, the overarching question here is how do you know that subject combines with object or subject and verb combines into object? You can do it infinitely and you can do it creatively as well, both are possible. But the meaning you see that after changing the words, although at the same place gets changed. If you pl place cat in place of man, the meaning would be entirely different. However, when you put man in place of cat, then the same thing will happen with you. Another important thing which I have been trying to mention here is that uh, there is a concept of infinite creativity when it comes to sin tax. Okay. So, what is this infinite creativity? 
basically we will first take an example that is cat is sleeping cat is sleeping can you add more words in this sentence if yes let's try you can write the cat behind the door is sleeping right you can say the cat behind the door behind the barn is sleeping and so on you can keep on adding words and you can keep on expanding the sentence as much as you can so this is the concept of infinite creativity when you use language in a sentence and you create a syntactical structure you find that there are so many things which can be possible it is just that we have to place in an organizational manner another important thing when we deal uh, syntax is of ambiguity so basically we try to look up ambiguity through two lenses one is the lexical ambiguity or you can say morphological ambiguity and there is a semantic ambiguity that we will definitely talk it in the later part of this session um uh, to make you clearer let's try to look up an example where you say bank okay there is a word called bank what happens in bank you think of uh, uh, you think of a financial uh, place where you deposit money and when you, where you withdraw money and where you visit frequently for the purpose of exchanging money right so bank refers to uh, the institution of money but this bank is also used to refer to the side of the river bank of the river right so if you refer a uh, bank in a specific context you need to make sure that it is not creating any confusion or it is not leading to more than two meanings or two meanings okay now let us come to the uh, meaning you know when it comes to the semantic part of it so call me a cab i'm writing here as well call me a cab if your friend says this what does uh, this sentence mean that, do you mean that your friend wants to uh, book a cab or do you think that your friend is asking a favor for you favor from you to book a cab or do you think that he is asking you to call him a cab now this is the example of ambiguity so you can't make out uh, clearly that whether this person is named as cab or this person is referring to a taxi so ambiguity refers to the uh, interpretation which comes in two or more than two ways now coming up to the aspect of semantics what do you think semantics is let's try to understand through the uh, uh, through this diagram look up at the glass and if i ask you a question that what do you think is in the glass some may say that it's a water some may say it's a soda and depending upon your context you will interpret uh, 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 you will interpret this liquid you will say it's a it's a cold drink right so you know a semantic refers to the meaning that you refer in the in your situation it's a notion basically that we talk about so when you say a uh, uh, dog what do you exactly refer do you think of an animal do you think of animal with four legs do you think of animal with horns this this depends on you that what mental image have you formed as far as dog is concerned if i say glass then what mental image have you formed as far as glass is concerned uh, uh, you can uh, think of any word and can essentially relate it with your mental representation and you will find that lot of people coming up with different uh, mental representations they are coming up with uh, different meanings so meaning is essentially uh, derived from form 
In order to understand semantics uh, in an easier way, let us consider this example. Black haired cats sleep behind the door. Okay. You know, uh, there you realize uh, what syntax and what semantics is because if you have to further uh, classify into a tree diagram or if you have to decompose it into several parts of a speech, you will be able to do it. But when these parts of a speech are combined, then what mental representation do you form? Have you seen the black haired cats? Or when you read this black haired cats, can you think of a cat which is black haired? Right. And you also see that uh, you form a mental representation in a way that takes you to the entire meaning. Okay. So, language is the system of thought, it is a connection of inherent ideas or you can say it has it is it consists of inherent connection and therefore this inherent com connection comes in two ways first form and form leads to meaning so as we are talking about semantics it is important to understand its notions and to uh, proceed further we have these four concepts which are important to understand. First is equivalence and to make you understand what equivalence is let us first take the example. Uh, my first example here is uh, Raj does not sing and the second example is Ali does not dance. Now think of these two examples and try to find out the relation in between these two. Do you think that Raj does not sing? So that is the reason or that is the idea why Ali does not dance? I think not because they are being spoken in an independent utterances. So, the idea of equivalence is neither A nor B uh, is equivalent to not A and B, right. Now, coming up to the point of entailment, we basically refer to the, uh, to the, to the point that uh, A is true so that B also becomes true. For example, if I say when Ravi sings, Ali claps. So, it means the crux here is that when A is true, B also is true. When Ravi sings, Ali claps, right. So, this is the concept of entailment. It means it, it entails that Ravi sings, okay. Now, there is another point which I should mention over here is contradiction. What happens in contradiction that there are two separate entities and uh, these entities contradict to each other. For example, John sold a car to Ravi and Ravi did not buy. Fine. So, we see that two sentences A and B are in contradiction and whenever A can be used truthfully to describe a situation, B cannot be used to describe it truthfully or whenever B can be used to, truth, uh, to describe it truthfully, then A cannot be used. So, that is how the contradiction occurs. Now, come to semantic ambiguity. In semantic ambiguity, as I told you that you use a sentence, but it may refer to more than two meanings. So, it uh, makes a matter that whether two are coming up in a proportion uh, and they are referring to one particular uh, entity A and B are driving 
the same entity or A and B are deriving the separate A and B. Fine. Now, there are some semantic roles to understand. What are these semantic roles? These are agent, these are theme, instrument, experience, location and source. So, in order to explain or in order to understand all these roles, let us first take an example. Mary wrote the letter with pen. What do you think is agent here? Basically, agent is Mary. Why? Because Mary is the entity that performs the action. Therefore, agent is referred or Mary is referred to as an agent. Now, the second point to mention here is theme. What do you think is the theme of the entire sentence? I would say the letter or letter. Why? Because the entity that is involved in is affected by it. Okay. So, here themes become, uh, a theme becomes the letter. Now, the question here is if agent is Mary, theme is the letter, then what is instrument? The entity that is used by the agent to perform an action is basically referred to an instrument. And this is pretty clear that here instrument is pen. Okay. Now, there are other points that need to be understood. For example, experience when a noun phrase performs an action or when, when an agent performs an action including and it includes uh, and there is a feeling, there is a perception okay, uh, that uh, uh, then it basically comes under the category of experience. Uh, there is also a point of location. Uh, location basically refers to the place where it is being done and source is where entity moves and basically it refers to goal is when an entity moves to. For example, you say Ravi borrowed some money from uh, Ali uh, and he, Ali bought a present and gave it to uh, Mary. So, in these examples you see that there is a source which uh, 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 their source which is in playing an important role and is basically proceeding in a sentence. Now, in this uh, slide you see semantic, uh, semantic lexical relation and how words in a sentence play an important role with respect to its meaning. So, first one as it is given is synonymy synonymy two or more forms with very much close related meanings. For example, you say broad okay, and you can also uh, make synonym of broad by saying that wide okay, or you can say height. Sometimes you try to replace height with the word conceal. Okay. So, this is the this is the relation that synonymy uh, uh, shares in, in between the words. Now, antonyms they are basically the opposite words that convey opposite meaning. Okay. For example, you write quick. So, if I ask you what is the opposite or what is the antonym of quick, you will come up with a, res with a response saying slow or maybe a related word. So, antonyms refer uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the meaning which come in opposite way. Uh, antonyms are basically classified into gradable antonyms and non-gradable antonyms. Uh, gradable antonyms can be used in comparative constructions like bigger than, smaller than and non-gradable uh, antonyms are not normally used, but the negative of one member does imply the other. For example, you say deader and then you say not possible or you can say more dead and then you say not possible. So, this is how uh, you understand 
uh, gradable antonyms and non gradable antonyms. There is another concept that is hyponymy when the meaning of one form is included in the meaning of another then the relationship is described as hyponymy example you say rose and you find that rose is a part of or rose is a kind of flower right you say uh, uh, carrot right and you say vegetable so when you refer to animal there are horses right dogs you say birds etc so the meaning are very much inclusive uh, or you can say the relationship is in a such a way that you find the meaning in the other then there are homophones and homonyms so homophones um, are interesting ones as the name itself suggests phone refers to the sound and uh, names refer to uh, refers to spellings so, if I specifically refer to homophones, I would say when two or more different written forms have the same pronunciation, they are, uh, they, they, they come under this label. So, for example, you say right and you also say right. In both the examples, uh, you realize that the pronunciation is same both the words sound same there is no difference when it comes to articulation but when you look up their spellings you find there is a difference in their meaning right w r i t e is used uh, entirely in a different context and r i g s t is absolutely used in a very different context Okay, now there is the point of understanding homonyms. Homonymy or homonyms are the one form written or spoken which have two or more unrelated meanings. For example, you encountered an example of, you have come across with an example of bank. So, bank here is referred to as a financial institution or is it referred to as the side of the river that you need to make out. So, this bank can be used with the same spelling in different different contexts. Now, coming up to the polysemy and metonymy, when one form has multiple meanings which are all related by extension, then you say that it is a polysemy. For example, you say head and the illustration that you give is the top of the body right or you say um, uh, head as a top of a company right. So, you basically extend uh, by giving up a multiple uh, presentation. Then you have the concept of metonymy, it is a type of relationship between words that are simply on a close connection in everyday experience. For example, you say car and you have wheels. So, car and wheels are interconnected and very much associated with it, right. You say king and king is inclined to have crown. So, king and crown shares a relationship of metonymy. So, dear learners, after going through the conceptual framework of what syntax and semantics is. Let us try to find out what we have learned so far. We have looked at syntax as the study of how words combine to form larger units such as phrases and sentences. We have learned how the tree diagrams are formed and we also understood how phrases are composed of parts of speeches and we looked uh, the parts of speeches in a very modern perspective or you can say that we have looked through the lens of descriptive linguistics. <coughs> the three steps of making a tree diagram that you learn today uh, 
involves involves using the phrase structure rules then looking for words and matching the lexical categories and also inserting uh, the words under the labels uh, we also discuss the constituency test uh, that include substitution test and standalone test we also looked language as a system of thoughts and we understood how form drives meaning um, semantic le re lexical relationships including synonymy antonyms hyponymy polysemy and uh, metonymy have been studied uh, before i close this session let me give you a sentence which is very which is very interesting and it was given by professor emeritus norm chomsky who said uh, colorless green ideas sleep furiously uh, do think of this sentence and try to find out that is this is this structure possible and if the structure is possible then are you able to drive the meaning from it i repeat colorless green ideas sleep furiously think of this sentence and try to find out that is it syntactically possible if it is possible then is it semantically possible with this we have come to an end of this session the references are these thank you for joining thank you Hi, I'm Chitwan Lalji, a PhD student of Health Economics under the supervision of Dr. Debian Pakrashi uh, from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kanpur. In one of my essays, I'm interested in understanding the relationship between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. Health indicators, both subjective and objective health indicators like mental health, self-assessed health, various measures of blood pressure and various measures of cholesterol. uh measures of blood pressure like systolic and diastolic bp you have your incidence of high bp map and incidence of high map and as far as cholesterol is concerned i have tried to concentrate more on total cholesterol good cholesterol and incidence of high cholesterol now before i go on to what have been my major contributions and various policy implications i would like to briefly tell you about the policy initiatives of who and various countries the who that is the world health organization it started with a campaign of five a day that is you should have five portions of fruits and vegetables per day that would be approximately you could say 400 grams of fruits and vegetables now a portion before we go further i'll just tell you what exactly is a portion one portion is equivalent to a medium sized apple or one small glass of fruit juice which is approximately 150 ml and uh, maybe 3 teaspoons of vegetables so uh, the who went with a five day campaign which was further taken up by various countries countries like uk netherland germany norway they adopted the five day policy while some went for expansionary dietary policies like france australia canada denmark So for example Australia it went for go for 2 plus 5 policy in which it said that you should consume five po two portions of fruits and five portions of vegetables per day and USA went for a policy of fruits and vegetables more matters that is you must consume more and more fruits and vegetables now in respect of these expansionary dietary policies and dietary propagations it has been found that only 28% of women and 25% of men they actually meet the recommended dietary norms of 5 a 5 a day portion so the major contribution of my work is firstly to find an association between fruits and vegetables whether there exist a relationship between fruits and vegetables and health indicators and if they exist whether if due to heterogeneity in the data so i will be doing it according to age by gender and by 
uh, your weight. So, apart from that, I will go for policy recommendations in which I will, I am basically studying uh, how much fruits and vegetables matter. Apart from that, which type matters more. So, for that, I have taken data from the Health Survey of England. Health Survey of England is an annual survey which takes uh, data, which conducts information regularly on demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. You have your lifestyle behaviors like an individual smokes or doesn't smoke, alcohol consumption, you have your sedentary and physical activities and you have various health uh, indicators also which have been collected. Uh, so, uh, before I go on to what exactly is my research, I would like to concentrate more on fruits and vegetables like what kind of questions were asked in the survey. Questions like what kind of fresh fruit do you eat? Did you eat any dried fruit yesterday? Don't count dried fruits in cereals, cakes. Apart from that, for vegetables, they asked how many tablespoons of vegetables did you eat yesterday? So, approximately after this whole survey was conducted, data was converted into portions of fruits. And uh, like for example, three, por three tablespoons of vegetables is equal into one portion. So, data was converted and provided to the users, that is us from the UK Data Health Survey. So, the major con contributions of my paper is that I found a strong negative association between uh, intake of fruits and self-assessed health, then various measures of uh, blood pressure like mean arterial pressure, high mean arterial pressure, high blood pressure, systolic and diastolic BP and your total cholesterol. Apart from that, I have found a strong positive association between consumption of vegetables and good cholesterol. So, it is recommended in a way that if you want to control your blood pressure, you must consume more and more fruits. And as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact your good cholesterol. Apart from that, I went in for a falsification test. A falsification test is basically conducted to know whether the model that you have adopted and the conclusions that you are drawing are not spurious. So, if uh, a falsification test is done to know, in a way it is tested by seeing an indicator, a health indicator which is not being impacted by your consumption of fruits and vegetables. And then see, we see whether there is significant result or not. If there is no significant result, that means your model is good and your results are non-spurious. So, what we did is for falsification test, we took ear complaints and infectious diseases. Now, ear complaints like if you are deaf since birth or you have some kind of imbalance body imbalance that is not being impacted by your post consumption of fruits and vegetables and we did find insignificant results. Apart from that infectious diseases like HIV, A, HIV AIDS etc. we found similar insignificant results indicating that our, uh, that our results are not spurious, non spurious. Apart from that we went uh, since there was a, a lot of heterogeneity in the data like uh, by gender, by age and by weight. We, can, we did the regression analysis. We found results which stated that as far as uh, fruits are concerned, it impacts a male's health more than a female's health. So, it is basically said a, a man should consume more fruits to impact his health whereas as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact a women's health more. But this has been only seen as far as cholesterol is concerned, the various measures of cholesterol like total cholesterol, good cholesterol and your incidence of getting high cholesterol. Now, after this we went in for a policy implication and in the policy implication we found, we tried to find two policy implications, what matters and exactly how much portion matters. So, as far as how much portion matters, we have found that on an average, five or more portions of fruits impact your overall health, that is your self-assessed health, your MAP, your incidence of high MAP and incidence of high BP. But if you want to have a good mental health, so you can optimize your mental health by consuming three or four portions of fruits as well. And similarly, has, uh, as far as self-assessed health and total cholesterol is concerned, an individual must consume four to five portions to optimally have the impact of consumption of fruits. Apart from that, vegetables have had a very little impact on your health. It only impacts your incidence of getting high MAP and high BP and uh, you, it's seen that only it impacts when you consume five or more portions of fruits. So, an optimum consumption of five or more portions of fruits and vegetables are recommended. But 
Fruits have a more impact on your overall health, on various measures like self-assessed health, mental health, your various measures of blood pressure and various cholesterol levels. Another thing that we find is which type of fruit matters. It has been seen that all size fruits, they impact your self-assessed health, your systolic and diastolic blood pressure, your mean arterial pressure, your high BP and incidence of getting high MAP and high cholesterol. But we find that uh, as far as frozen fruits or canned fruits are concerned, they have a, they help in regulating your incidence of getting high MAP or high BP, but it has a trade-off that means there is something negative happening, it reduces the good cholesterol in your body. Apart from this, it, if, you if you have an incidence of getting high cholesterol, it is recommended that you must consume fruit juices because it has a s impact in reducing your probability of getting high cholesterol. And uh, dried fruits, they impact your self-assessed health. As far as vegetables are concerned, very little impact has been seen. It has only been seen in case of uh, uh, portion of salads and its association with self-assessed health. Another thing that they have seen is vegetables in composite, they have an association with good cholesterol. So overall, my research basically says that there is an association between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. And um, it is highly recommended that an individual, in order to be healthy, must consume five or more portions of fruits and five or more portions of vegetables per day. But fruits have a more impact on your overall health. Apart from that, all size fruits, they have a better impact on your overall health, your mental health, various measures of blood pressure and cholesterol. So, thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. Perhaps the most popular literary genre after novel is the short story. Sharp, compact narratives whose charm lies not only in what is said, but also in what remains unsaid. Today I'll be reading one of the shortest instances of a short story that I have ever encountered. And Indeed, the very charm of this particular story that I'm going to read out today lies in the way it abruptly ends. It is an ancient tale from Mesopotamia, which has been retold by several authors, among whom the name of Somerset Mom stands out. Uh, the adaptation that I'll be reading out is perhaps the closest to the one that Mom wrote. The story is titled, in all of its adaptations almost, as Appointment in Samara. Here is the story. A merchant in Baghdad once sent one of his servants to the market. The servant was supposed to buy provisions for the merchant, but when he returned, he came back empty-handed. Indeed, the servant had all gone white, and trembling with fear, he told his master that he had met death in the marketplace. When I entered the market, the servant said to his master, I was jostled by a woman, and when I turned to look at her, I saw that she was death. I am very scared, master, because death looked at me with a threatening gesture. Can you please lend me your horse so that I can fly away from Baghdad to the town of Samara and thereby escape death? The master, being a good man, gave his servant his best horse and saw him gallop off to Samara to escape death. Then the master himself went to the marketplace and confronted death. Why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant? Asked the master to death. And death replied, It was not a threatening gesture. Rather, it was a start of surprise. I was astonished to see your servant here today, because this evening, I have an appointment with him in Samara. See you 
in the next episode of Literary Snippet.